o algo? Hello, this is Daniel Medina. I hear you, Dan. I don't see you, but I hear you. Okay. I had to call in. We tried uh, the link, and now it's not working again. I'm going to have to try and get off a of VPN and see if that works. So so what I did was I used, um, used the phone number that I got with the invitation, and... Um, and then I entered in the new access code that you provided. Okay, it it is broadcasting now, so okay. Um, yeah, talking to him through that, we are broadcasting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can send me a text. Okay. Okay.
Hi, this is Sharon Brzinga. Is anybody on? I hear you, Sharon. Hi, who's that? This is Gina. Hi, Sharon. This is Dan. Oh, hey, Dan. Hi, Tina. Yeah, Dan, I can't get the computer to work again this afternoon. I can't either. No, it's, it caught me. So. <laughs> well, we're just back to 1999. We'll just do it the old-fashioned way. It works. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to go back on mute. Thanks. And don't forget, uh, star six unmutes you on the system. And so we have to, okay. So do we have to right. and then start, is it a toggle? So does it go back and forth? That's absolutely correct. So if you have to unmute star six to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.
this back or something like that so we don't have any right to the land without their approval. Okay, please uh, take Denise Bryan off mute. And then Denise Bryan, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself and we'll do a sound check just to make sure that we can hear you. Yeah, so Denise, we should be able to hear you now. Um, can you say something? Oh, Denise, good evening. Great, uh, good evening. This is Tim Sultan first. We can hear you uh, just fine. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. I appreciate that. Okay, you bet. Um, so we'll get started here in about about three yeah, minutes or so. Thank you. All right, and let's begin. So I wanted to welcome everyone to the Wordsmith Restoration Advisory Board meeting tonight. My name is Tim Sultan, post with Galen Driscoll, and I'll be serving as the facilitator for our meeting this evening. Um, a court reporter is here to capture a verbatim transcript of tonight's meeting, and this online meeting is also being recorded. We're doing something a little bit more challenging than we've done in the past. We're doing a hybrid meeting with some folks in person and some online. So I appreciate your patience in advance. Uh, with the uh, extra steps that are needed to make this a success. Before I review the agenda, let me turn to our co-chairs for welcoming remarks. So Dr. Varley, would you like to say any opening remarks? Yeah, I'd just like to thank everybody for showing up and being available and for all the good work that we're all doing together and hopefully we'll continue to keep making good strides towards progress. Mark? Um, I'm looking forward to moving forward as well. It's been a long time coming. Um, I'm glad that things are finally starting to happen and that we are actually moving towards uh, some income remedial actions. 
All right, well, thank you very much to our co-chairs, Dr. Catherine Varley and Mr. Mark Henry. Um, let's go ahead and move uh, to slide three, if we could. We have a full agenda tonight, and we'll begin with updates from our RAB members and then review RAB business items, including uh, the continuation of community RAB member and community co-chair terms and action items. Um, after that, we'll move into the remedial investigation and interim remedial action update. Uh, we've reserved a significant portion of the time towards the end of our meeting uh, to address RAB members' questions. And also, portions of, of those portions of the agenda will be for RAB members' discussions. And you see the RAB members will introduce them one by one here in just a moment. Let's see, towards the end of, of our discussion tonight, we will have a public comment period where we'll hear from members of the public and have the opportunity for three-minute verbal comments to the RAB. Uh, during the technical presentation, please do hold your questions until the end of the presentation. It's a relatively brief uh, presentation. We'll address those questions at the end, as well as in the RAB member questions uh, portion of the agenda. Um, so for the RAB members who are here in person, if you have a comment that you'd like to make, please raise your hand so that I can see it. I'm, I'm over here to your right and somewhat behind you. <laughs> Uh, for those who are uh, RAB members who are participating virtually, please raise your hand electronically, and I'll be monitoring that as well as, as the support staff from Airstar, Sarah Rifty, and, and her colleagues. Let's see. Um, for those of you who have joined remotely, we do ask that you mute your microphone so that we don't have any distractions or background noise. It will also be very important because there are some members who are some participants who are participating virtually and without display as well to please each time you speak please state your name and please make sure that we have only one person speaking at a time i know that can be challenging but please try your best to do that that's going to make life much easier on our court reporter as well and uh, quintina our court reporter if you need us to stop and pause and restate anything just just let me know Okay, so now let's move uh, to slide four if we could, and I wanted to review the ground rules for our meeting tonight. After I read these, I'll ask the RAB members if these uh, continue to work and if, if you uh, continue to support these ground rules. So I'll read these off. Respect one another and maintain an atmosphere of open dialogue and exchange of ideas. Use our time together efficiently, wisely, and respectfully. Listen and remain open to each other's varying points of view. Speak clearly and succinctly one person at a time, avoid interrupting others. Share information early, openly, and honestly. Maintain a propensity for progress. Prepare, discuss, document, and move forward. Accurately and objectively relate to others the discussions that occur at board meetings. So, RAP members, uh, do those ground rules continue to work for you? Yes, they do. Yes, yes sir. Great. All right. Any changes needed to those? No. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. So I'm going to do uh, my job till you hug me or you hate me and, and try to keep us on track and on the agenda while also providing time for just good dialogue among the RAB members and at then soliciting public comment towards the end of the meeting as well. So let's now just uh, confirm that all of our RAB members are present and ensure we have a quorum. Um, the operating procedures, kind of the constitution of this RAB meeting uh, dictate what a quorum is. And so let me just go through uh, name by name. And if you're here, please just say that you're here. Uh, Bill Gaines. Here. Thank you, sir. Mark Henry. Here. Thank you. Arnie LaRidge. Here. Thank you. Joe Maxwell. Here. So we have Ryan Mertz. And let me just look to make sure to see whether Ryan Mertz has joined us virtually. I'm not saying Ryan Mertz. Do we have Jerry Schmidt? And I'm not saying Jerry Schmidt virtually. Um, as we'll indicate here briefly, Jerry Schmidt will be continuing his term, which ends September 11th, but not continuing beyond that point. Uh, do we have Daniel Stock? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Stock. David Wynn? Here. Thank you, David. Kathy Wusterbarth? Here. Thank you, Kathy. Let's see, for the Air Force, we have Dr. Catherine Barley? Here. Thank you. 
And do we have representation from a suborbital township? And if you are representing a suborbital township virtually, please raise your hand electronically. I'm not seeing anyone. Okay. Let's see. Uh, I know that we have Denise Bryan with District Health Department 2 on the line. So, Denise, are you with us? Yes, good evening. I'm here. Great. Thank you. Denise is joining virtually. Do we have uh, Panit Vidge? Here. Thank you. And we have Beth Place with Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. Here. Thank you. Let's see, do we have representation from Oscoda Township? And if you are representing Oscoda Township uh, via virtual means, please raise your hand electronically. Okay. Mr. Michael Munson. Here. Thank you. And USDA Forest Service, uh, Mr. Ben Weiss is with us, correct? Yes, I'm here. Great, thank you. That was a rhetorical question. I can see you right in front of me. <laughs> and I believe uh, Jesse Stintebeck was also going to join uh, virtually. Let me just see if we have Jesse on the line. I see Jesse has raised her hand electronically. So we have uh, both Jesse and Ben representing Forest Service. Okay, and we also have both our co chairs. So uh, we do have a quorum per our operating procedures, section 3.10. Okay. Well, I think that takes us through the administrivia. Thank you for your patience with that. Uh, let's move to uh, slide five, if we could. Uh, actually, on this this slide here, uh, just a reminder that we will have this the public comment period towards the end of the the uh, evening, and you can email me at Tim at Gail and Driscoll, or you can use the uh, you can simply come up to the microphone when we get to that point. I'll also be asking those who are joining us virtually to raise their hand electronically if they would like to make to make a comment. Let's see. Again, all right, let's move to the next slide and we'll move to stakeholder updates, please. Okay. And so uh, we are now entering the portion of the agenda for the RAB members to provide brief updates about any activities since our last meeting and so on. Uh, let's move to slide seven, please. We'll start off with the Air Force update. All right, Catherine Varley, Wordsmith Beck. So right now we've been doing a lot of field work out there and Ms. Paula Bond's going to help us with explaining where we are with each of our projects here in a little bit. Um, we have made it through step one of collecting groundwater samples, step two, uh, we are well underway of collecting soil samples, and step three, bath samples, is starting soon. Along with that, we also are planning on moving forward as far as the IRAs go. We appreciate everybody that came out last night and look forward to seeing your comments if you haven't submitted them already. Tim, back to you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay, next slide if we could. And so let's start off with uh, any updates from our community RAD members. I'll go one by one. Uh, Mr. Mark Henry, our community co-chair, any updates you'd like to share? Um, one point of clarification from Catherine's uh, comments. Mm. Uh, vast sampling is vertical aquifer sampling. Mm. Uh, for those of you who are not into acronyms. <laughs> um, from, the, uh, from the community co-chair's point of view, the, uh, the community RAB has been working at reviewing the interim remedial action proposed plan for Ratliff Park. We've had both internal meetings and many of us have attended the informal technical meetings that were provided by the Air Force so that we get some clarification on a few things. Uh, beyond that, um, there has not been much activity other than um, many of the people in the RAB and the NOW group uh, attended a tour that I provided uh, working with the National Wildlife Federation to um, bring people around and make them familiar where some of the contaminated sites are on the base. All right. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Uh, Dan Stock, any updates that you'd like to share? Okay. Thank you. How about to Joe Maxwell? Joe, anything you'd like to share? Okay. And to Bill Gaines. Thank you, sir. 
and to Kathy Wistbar. Well, I think I'm going to take all of their time. If that's <laughs> there <you> okay. Go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, we have, as Mark has mentioned, we've been busy uh, in terms of the community members that are participating in, uh, for instance, the webinar that we, we held last week regarding the interim remedial action. We made sure that we provided the community opportunity to hear some of the input and technical review that the now members had regarding the uh, interim remedial action. So we um, had some good participation with that. We also highlighted the newly released movie called No Defense, which it, it shows the experiences of the veterans and civilians on this base related to their contamination. And um, as Mark said, there was a tour that was participated um, well with that. And it actually happened in this room here. Um, also, last week we released a report in conjunction with the National Wildlife Federation that summarizes the events of the uh, of the of the site itself. Um, I'm going to take the time actually to read a little bit of that report, if that's okay with you. Um, it is uh, PFAS contamination at the former Wordsmith Air Force Base, the true story, and it was produced by Nadar Water and the National Wildlife. National Wildlife Federation and released last week in conjunction with the Great Lakes PFAS Action Network, which is a network of impacted communities fighting for better policies and PFAS cleanup. The report is a hard look at the actions taken or not taken by the federal government and the state of Michigan to mitigate harm to the community and clean up PFAS pollution there. The report highlights what must change in order to rebuild trust with the Oscoda community and see meaningful action on PFAS cleanup. The recent Department of Defense Inspector General report evaluation of the Department of Defense's action to control contaminated effects from PFAS at Department of Defense installations released in, on July 22, 2021, found that the DOD officials are not applying an enterprise-wide approach to mitigating PFAS contamination at military sites and that people and the environment may continue to be exposed to PFAS contamination unnecessarily as a result. This report that was created here for uh, Wordsmith uh, illustrates how the inactions outlined in the DOD report have materialized in real time. It is a testament of what needs to change. The federal and state governments must do more and do it better to protect people and wildlife, and we need stronger policies at the state and federal levels to hold polluters and regulators responsible for timely cleanup. The, the report is sectioned out into actions that occurred with the U.S. Air Force and the state of Michigan. It describes the issue or the need that occurred at the site, what should have happened, and then what really happened. The sections include actions that are inconsistent with the known severity of the problem, and there are 14 listed of those related to the Air Force's actions. False promises, there are two of those. Endless delays, there are four listed of those. And for the state of Michigan, the inability or unwillingness to protect people and natural resources in Oscoda, and there are 12 of those instances listed. The document was thoroughly researched as you can see by the 86 references that were listed. And I would, I would like to thank all of the environmental partners that we have um, related to the NOW group and helping uh, the RAB. And also a special thank you to uh, RAB members and NOW members that are doing an enormous amount of work related to this site. Thank you. Great. All right, thank you very much, Kathy. We appreciate that. Um, Ryan Mertz and Jerry Schmidt are not with us, so we'll go to Arnie LaRich. Arnie? The uh, Department of Defense IG report that Kathy just mentioned is huge. And we've known, many of us have known, that the federal government, EPA, Department of Defense, Office of Management and Budget, has not taken action and asked for the budget to do what's right and required under the Department of Defense policies and CERCLA, the uh, Superfund law, and, uh, and at this site specifically. I beg the public to talk to your congressionals and ask them if they've read it, if they understand it, what they're going to do about it, because if the Department of Defense is not pushed, 
to follow their policies after this report, then we're going to lose the momentum. They will not ask for the money because this, they have, they need money for other things. And we've seen that happen at this site. We don't get our fair share. So ask us if you have questions, ask the now group. There's lots of people here that you can ask and I'm speaking to the public right now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. And David Wynn. Nothing at this time. Okay. Thank you, David. So we now heard from all the community RAB members and uh, there are also members of the RAB who represent governmental organizations. Dr. Varley started off by providing an update for the Air Force, but let's go through the others as well. So we'll start with the USDA Forest Service and uh, let's turn uh, first to Jesse Stunebeck and then Ben, I'll turn to you to see if you have anything additionally. Uh, but um, Sarah, if you could take Jesse off. Jesse, we should be able to hear you. Any updates that you'd like to share? Hi, this is Jesse. No, I don't have anything. I'll leave it to Ben if he has anything. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. We appreciate that. And over to Ben Weiss then. Uh, in the last, since we last met, uh, we've had continued good communication with the Air Force. And that's about all I can add. No new actions at this time. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Let's then turn to Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, and to Beth Place. Hi. Thank you. And so, um, we would just like to update on some of Eagle's responses um, to Air Force actions out here. And Catherine mentioned earlier that the RI is occurring in a stepwise approach and they've already completed a few steps. Um, so sampling existing groundwater monitoring wells, they've begun soil sampling and pretty soon they'll become do the vertical aquifer sampling. And so for for the two events that have already begun, Eagle has been on site or representative for us has been on site for, to um, perform oversight and collect uh, select quality assurance samples. So basically a duplicate of Air Force samples that we're having analyzed at a separate lab, just to really um, have a peace of mind or you know insurance on, on the analytical results. Um, we also wanted to mention that uh, this week we have been participating in discussions on the vertical aquifer sampling location, and that, that has been going well. Um, Eagle has completed the review of the monthly BCT minutes that are in our, in our possession, um, comparing those to those recordings online that Air Force provided to us. And so by the end of the week, all the BCT minutes that we have from the monthly meetings will be sent back to Air Force. And then the plan is that they will review that and then Air Force will let us know when we can make those available on the MPART website. I believe they also put those um, in the library, but Catherine can comment on that. Well, we've been reviewing an explanation of significant differences for remedy enhancement for Napa plume at LF3031. We'll be providing our comments to that ESC, our explanation of significant differences um, on uh, by the end of the week. We also wanted to mention that um, Air Force had previously provided us the four quarters of data for their vapor intrusion investigation. Um, Eagle has communicated to Air Force that at the locations where outdoor soil gas samples were above the non-residential site-specific values established and agreed to with Eagle and Air Force, that we would like Air Force to complete indoor sub-slab samples as a next step. Um, and that is to, um, to have a better idea if there are any potential health concerns within those building. Okay. Um, I also know that, um, Kathy, we, we always appreciate your commitment on NELS, all the time that they put in here on this. And we just want to, um, you know, we, I have a statement that, um, that we have regarding um, the now and uh, the now um, paper, I can't remember the name of it, that you were just discussing. Okay, 
And so just a few highlights out of that are Michigan just wants to let folks know that um, on the Wurtsmith website, there is a complete timeline. So, so there's a few more steps in that timeline than what was provided and you know, understandably. And so we do have that online on the MPART site. Of course, my computer locked up. Okay. <laughs> and then um, just that Michigan has had a pro proactive and transparent approach to PFAS contamination and has been widely recognized as a national model for addressing what was once considered an emergent class of contaminants when the state of Michigan created the PFAS action response team in November of 2017. And since that time, in our opinion, no state or federal agency has done more to address PFAS contamination or hold responsible parties accountable and educate this, the public about this class of contaminant. And so we agree with many of the findings made by the National Wildlife Federation and now regarding Air Force's response to contamination at the former Wordsmith Air Force Base. However, having said that, the report fails to provide a complete timeline of the state's work. And that, that's available on the MPART website. And so Eagle agrees that the lack of federal action on PFAS and DOD's reliance on the slow moving circle process has certainly complicated Michigan's efforts to accelerate, accelerate the US Air Force cleanup on the former Wirt Smith Air Force Base, but MPART will continue to advocate for the public and do everything within the state's power to see that this formal federal facility is cleaned up to state standards and the public's drinking water and environment is protected. And I can definitely see that the pace recently on Wurtsmith, um, although we'll always strive to have a faster pace, that, that we do agree that we are seeing action happening out here, the two IRAs, as well as um, we are very glad that Air Force is in the field um, performing the remedial investigation. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Place. And let's move to slide nine, if we could, and to Oscoda Wurtsmith Airport Authority, Mr. Michael Munson. Yes, sir. Airport Authority, a quick uh, bullet point summary of airport activities. The airport business has been very active of late. Uh, our on site clients' new hangar build uh, is progressing. Uh, the Air Force was on site uh, this summer with an exercise. M. Arrow uh, last week and through September is working with the airport maintenance staff crack sealing and repainting runways and taxiway markings. Long-term activity, uh, there'll be some taxiway rebuild um, uh, and, they, and, and all the taxiways will be rebuilt. And that's it, thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Let's see, Lisa Sutton with Osable Township is not with us. Uh, let's turn to Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Mr. Pernit Vich. So um, I have a few updates uh, regarding the re residential well sampling uh, round two. Uh, a total of around 280 residential wells were sampled and around 215 uh, results letters were mailed last week. Um, also, um, also a deer press release will be out tomorrow and MPART webpage will be updated for deer and wildlife uh, and you'll be able to access the revised map uh, that is for three miles coverage area and uh, along with the final deer report. Uh, and also the revised deer, fish, and foam signs will be uh, posted soon. All right, thank you for that update. We appreciate it. Okay, Bill Palmer with Oscoda Township is not with us tonight. Um, let's move on to Department of Health District 2. Sarah, if you don't mind unmuting Denise Bryan, who's joining us virtually. Uh, Denise, any updates that you'd like to share? Well, local public health does not have any new updates at this time, but thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you for joining. We appreciate that. Okay, let's move to that next slide then. And we'll move into the RAB business portion of the agenda. Um, and actually, the next slide, um, just an, uh, for your awareness, uh, the community RAB members' terms expire on the the 11th of September of this year, and the community co-chair's term as co-chair expires uh, this month as well. Um, of the primary community RAB members, 
Dan Stock, Mark Henry, Joe Maxwell, Bill Gaines, Kathy Wusterbarth, Arne Rich, Ryan Mertz, and David Wynn do wish to continue uh, serving as primary community RAV members. Jerry Schmidt does not wish to continue as a primary community RAV member. He um, wanted to thank the RAV for the opportunity and uh, just appreciates the work that y'all are doing. Um, he mentioned that that his uh, law practice is getting a bit busier than it had been, and so he's unable to devote the time needed to what he mentioned to me was a very important cause and, and, and focus area. Um, so as such, uh, Dan Stock, Mark Henry, Joe Maxwell, William Gaines, Kathy Wusterbarth, Arnie Larich, Ryan Mertz, and David Wynn will begin another two-year term as primary community RAD members on September 11th, 2021. So congratulations to y'all, and thank you for, uh, for your service. Uh, to the rep. Now for the community co-chair, um, Mark Henry is our current community co-chair and he is uh, the only one who has expressed interest in, in serving in that role. So Mark, if, if it works for you, you'll, you'll begin uh, tonight your one-year term as community co-chair. Works for me. All right. Well, thank you very much for, for uh, agreeing to, to play that leadership role. Great. Okay. Now, so there are some alternate community RAB members as well. Um, this ties into the discussion of the RAB operating procedures. And so the RAB operating procedures are under review. Um, and I'll turn to the co-chairs for an update on, on this in just a moment. But I believe there had been some changes suggested, um, some uh, additional discussion that's ongoing between the co-chairs on this matter. And Mark, I think your suggestion was to hold off on uh, renewing any alter alternate community RAB members' terms until the RAB operating procedures are adjusted as that may impact it. I anticipate that the operating procedures uh, will be changed uh, following many of the edits that have been suggested. And the new operating procedures I'm anticipating will not have alternate and primary members. Everybody involved will be a primary member. Okay, great. All right. And Dr. Bartley, anything you'd like to share on? We're that? working together on this and hopefully we can do it with our team here. Great. Okay. Well, good. Well, so also the co-chairs have a, a standard practice to meet following each rev and, and I participate in those meetings with them to take notes and so on. Um, they did uh, meet on August 12th, I believe it was. And there are currently 12 open action items. And I think the plan is to, to meet again following this, this RAB meeting to go through open action items, look at agenda topics for future meetings and so on. Is that? Absolutely. Is that okay, great. Okay, um, well, co-chairs, anything else you'd like to address on RAB business topics? I don't have anything. Me either. Okay. All right, well, so thank you for all, all that that long intro, but it's important, I think, just to, to manage the, the mechanics of this body, especially when you have a cleanup that does take an extended period of time to keep this body functioning and active throughout what can be a, a very long process. So I appreciate all the work that you've, you've done for that. Let's now move into uh, slide 12, if we could, and shift to our remedial investigation and interim remedial action update. And we'll turn to Paula Bond with Aerostar. So, Paula, over to you. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out, members of the RAV tonight, gathering here in person, members of the public, and for those of the folks who are online. So, this is two presentations for me in a row, two nights in a row. So, you guys are the luckiest people. <laughs> So I'm going to give an update on the remedial investigation work and the interim remedial action work that we are doing at Wordsmith to keep the project moving. Um, and with that, I'll just kick off and just say next slide, please. So the first slide that we're looking at is just a summary of the circle process that's already been mentioned here tonight and the IRA circle process. So we're doing two different things um, as part of this work, as everybody knows, the remedial investigation. Um, so the first component to that is RI scoping, which we have met with Eagle on several occasions um, and had multiple scoping meetings to discuss our approach and our path forward, where we're gonna sample, how we're gonna sample, things like that. Once that scoping process was complete, 
we moved into develop, to developing our work plan or our uh, UFP QAP um, to address everything that we were going to do, our procedures, our methods uh, of accomplishment for the work. That also includes a risk assessment work plan. Um, and then we move into the field data collection portion and the RI report. Um, the IRA circular process, which was something that, that we also talked about a little bit last night, um, begins the same way with IRA scoping. We had several meetings with Eagle discussing um, the initial approach for the IRAs, how we were going to implement those methods uh, of accomplishment. So that scoping process is complete. When we moved into the next phase, which is developing the proposed plans for both FTO2 at Clarks Marsh and Van Etten Lake at Ken Ratliff Memorial Park. So currently, the Clarks Marsh proposed plan has been finalized. We had the public meeting earlier this year. The proposed plan for Van Etten Lake at Ken Ratliff Memorial Park is currently in the 30-day public comment period, which ends on Friday, actually. And then that was the meeting that we had last night, uh, was the public meeting for that <clears throat> proposed plan. The next step after the proposed plans are complete is the interim record of decision. For Clarks Marsh, that is currently uh, well underway uh, and hopefully that will be uh, ready to be sent to Eagle for review uh, pretty soon. Uh, we can't start the rod for Van Etten Lake until, of course, the proposed plan is, is done. Um, and like I said, hopefully that will be done in the next few weeks. Um, after that is the remedial design. Once everyone agrees in the proposed plan and the rod, we move to the design, which actually lays out the engineer drawings for um, the design of the IRAs. And those will be included in an uh, interim remedial action work plan, which will outline our methods and procedures of accomplishment for the IRAs. And finally, the interim remedial action itself. So the interim remedial action work plan for Clark's Marsh is under Eagle Review currently. So once that is done, the Air Force gets that back, reviews comments, responds to those. Um, we'll finish that document out, and then the, the rod gets signed. We'll be ready to start the IRA, Clark's Marsh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the slides. Next slide, please. So we'll start off going over the, the remedial investigation. So as Catherine mentioned earlier, we are going in a stepwise process to accomplish the field work under the RI, and step one, was collecting groundwater samples from monitoring wells, existing wells that had never been sampled for PFAS on base. So we wanted to collect that additional data to help support our approach for the RI so that we can collect better samples, pick better locations for later stages of field work. That began on July the 19th, and that project is, that task is complete with the exception of a few wells that uh, we still have to get access to. Next slide, please. So this is a figure showing the PFOS data, and these are the same figures that are out in the lobby. This just shows the revised plume based on that new data that we collected. Um, it's just been tweaked in, a, in several places based on the new data that we collected, but it's very similar to the, the existing plume map that we had before. Um, and we've broken them out into PFOS and PFOA just to give you a better idea of where those plumes are for each one of those individual compounds. Next slide, please. This is the PFOA map, and you can see the difference between the two. Um, just as a, a general um, concept, concept, the PFOS map shows a small, smaller plume. The concentrations are higher, but it's not as widespread. The PFOA plume has lower concentrations generally, but it's more widespread, and that's the difference for the two plumes that you see out there. Next slide, please. So the RI work plan, or the Uniform Federal Federal Policy Quality Assurance Project Plan um, that we prepared. That was submitted to Eagle earlier in the spring. They have reviewed that, provided the Air Force comments. Uh, we are responding to those comments and we're working together to, to respond to the comments so that we can go to the field in these particular stages that we're working on now so that we can get to the field earlier because we're trying to get as much work as we, do, as we can done as quickly as we can. Um, so step two, which is the phase that we're currently in, is soil sampling, and field soil sampling, and we initiated that on August the 16th. We're still doing that uh, currently, and we'll be doing that for a couple more weeks. Uh, we've sampled over 80 samples um, since we started, and that number is, is well over 100 at this point. 
um, and we'll give another update next time on the additional data that we collect between now and the next round. Next slide, please. This is just a figure. We started our soil sampling program at the fire training area. And this is a figure showing the locations that we have sampled at the fire training area so far. Next slide, please. We also completed the sampling at the DRMO, uh, which is in the northern portion of the, the former base. This is just a map showing the sampling locations uh, in that area. Next slide. So currently we are working on soil sampling in the base op on the base operations apron. This is a figure showing where we have sampled so far and there are um, several more samples that we're gonna have to collect in that area. So that is where we're currently working and we'll continue working over there for another week or so. And then we'll move on to the other areas that we have planned for soil sampling. Next slide. So uh, step three of our initial investigation process is vertical aquifer sampling or VAS. You're gonna hear that, that acronym VAS a lot um, as we move forward. And that is planned to start on the 16th, I think, or the 13th, sorry. So in two weeks, we're gonna start that. Uh, we may start a little bit early next week if we can uh, get everything in line with our um, drillers and, and get everything lined up. So that is, but that is happening very soon. Um, next slide please. So we'll move into talking just a little bit about the IRA, uh, the proposed plan for Van Etten Lake, like I mentioned, that is out right now for public comment. The public comment period closes on Friday, so comments need to be postmarked by Friday. Um, the interim record of decision for Clark's Marsh is under Air Force review, and then the remedial action work plan for Clark's Marsh is under Eagle review. Next slide, please. So this is a graphic of the RI, RI and IRA field work timeline. So I have all of our major milestones on here just to give everyone an idea of what we're planning and where we are. Um, the RI field work began back in July. And if we're, as we move down the timeline, the next thing that we have on here is, is the FTO2 at Clark's Marsh IRA construction, which we have right now toward the end of October. So hopefully all of our documentation can be completed, uh, the ROD and the work plan, and that we can move forward with that. I will let everybody know because we're trying to get to the field as quickly as we can. There's a lot of, of work that's been going on in the background. We have been um, uh, working feverishly on procurement of the materials and supplies for that uh, IRA because a lot of the materials that we need have really, uh, long lead times, a lot of our process tanks, because these systems are uh, specialized for our needs. A lot of our materials are special order um, equipment designed especially for our project. So many of the materials are long lead times. And if you guys know, if you're doing any construction work at all, it's hard to get anything right now. So, but we are working really hard to have things, we ha are having materials delivered. Um, just yesterday, we had a, a large shipment of materials. So we are getting ready as soon as our documentation is signed and sealed, we are ready to start uh, hopefully grading out there and pouring concrete on Clark's Marsh IRA. So the next thing that we have um, on the schedule <clears throat> is the Van Etten Lake at Ken Ratliff Memorial Park IRA. That one is a little further out because we all know that the proposed plan is still out for public comment. So we still have to get that documentation process done, the rod and the work plan before we start out there. So it's pushed out a little bit farther. Um, and then as we move through the winter and the summer continuing, we'll continue working on the, the RI as we go through the winter as, as, as we can work as the weather lets us. So we'll do as much as we can and then we'll finish up um, next year. And hopefully by that time, the IRAs will also be in place and up and running by that time. So that's kind of the schedule that we have right now laid out. Um, everything subject to change uh, based on uh, weather delays, schedule, procurement, and things like that. But this is this is what we're looking at right now. So next slide, please. All right, that's really all I have for an update on the RI and IRAs. Uh, if anybody has any questions on anything, I'd be more than happy to take questions. So, so yeah, let's go ahead and, and go, uh, Mark, to you first. I went through that you, really fast, sorry. As a reminder, if you could uh, please state your name uh, for the report. Go ahead. Mark Henry. Um, I actually have two questions. 
Okay. Uh, the soil sampling that has been completed, was that done down to the water table or below the water table? That was, we aren't collecting any samples below the water table. So that's all Vado sown or non-saturated soil sampling. For the purposes of remediation, mm -hmm. um, you may want to collect a few samples below the water table to find out how much is absorbed to the aquifer material that's not dissolved. Um, and that is, that's a great question, a great comment. And we are in the RI, we are looking at saturated materials for fade and transport components. That's not part of this step in the process. That's going to happen a little bit later, but we are going to be looking at, at those properties in the, in the subsurface as we move forward with the RI. The other question that I had was of the 80 some or 90 some wells that have been sampled that had not previously been sampled for PFOS. Mm -hmm. How many wells are on the base that have not been sampled for PFAS? There, that's a great question, and I don't have an exact number for you. There are a lot of monitoring wells. <laughs> on there are hundreds of monitoring wells on Wordsmith. Uh, most of the wells, as we know, were installed for other projects to look at other plumes all over the base. So the wells that we chose to select for this phase were wells that were. Um, downgrading it or near the, the PFAS plumes that we already know, if they were in a good position, if they were at a depth that we thought would give us some good data. So we didn't go sample everything that had never been sampled if they weren't in the right location. So we just selected a subset of those. Just a clarification, yeah. were most of those wells around the perimeter or were they all over? They're really, they're really all over. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you very much. And uh, other questions about this presentation from the RAP members. Go ahead, sir. Uh, first, I'd like to say that there is an ongoing action item, something in the uh, administrative things that you wrote that calls for the slides to be legible. Mm, correct. But they are not. Mm. Okay. That's been a continuing problem, continuing frustration. Mm. I find that just these slides are reviewed. Why can they not be reviewed for compliance with our procedures? Uh, I spent some time looking at the conceptual site model out there, and I do not know where the deficiency is. I know that we've seen a lot of PFAS and plume evidence in state data, but I do not out there see any evidence of sampling in the area west of FTO2 as far as water sampling. I know that there has to be PFOS before moving possibly more into the base. There are biota samples that lead to a do not eat fish advisory in Allen Lake on Forest Service land. That I don't think there were any industry out in the forest service land. It has to have come from this base, yet there's nothing in the conceptual site model or the testing that I see that leads to that. I know that there was a significant PFOS spill in the DRMO area. I know that settling beds were buried. Uh, between the runway and Camp Nisikoni. I haven't seen any evidence in what I see as far as the conceptual site model or the sampling there of how that is represented. And I'd like to know where your plan is and what data you have to represent that data and whether or not you plan to replicate the state data, which shows a significantly broader spectrum of PFAS across the base than anything I've seen in the area, any Air Force data. So do you plan to incorporate that data as you promised long ago, or do you plan to, at some point before we're presented a fait accompli with the RI, complete an investigation that's in fact all the way around, regardless of the assumptions that you make about specific area water flow. Thank you. Okay, Bill. And just for, for clarity, 
I'm sorry, just for clarity, that's Bill Gaines, community rep member. Go ahead, Dr. Yeah, Barley. This is Catherine Barley. So we are using all data available. We are not using just Air Force data. When Eagle provides us their data, we use their data. When Mark provides the data, we use the data. We are driving forward together. We are working this as a team. Um, Forest Service is working with us. Um, OA Airport's working with us. Everybody is working together. We are sharing data. We are actively updating our CSM as we get data. Um, Eagle is working with us. They've provided a lot of data. So I don't quite understand your comment about the RAV slides not being legible because in my mind they are very legible. So maybe we can talk afterwards and we can clarify what you would expect because then we can work towards something that we can all agree will work. Well, I um, have a relatively small screen and hey, sir? My, my eyesight has glaucoma. I'm sorry, but that's, that's the way it is. It happens when you get to be an elderly person, and I guess I recognize that. The other thing is, I don't know when the conceptual site model will be updated. What I looked at out there did not represent what you just said. Sir, the conceptual In my understanding. It is, we are updating it every time we get data. It is a continuous model. Colin can speak to it. Colin's got the online virtual tool, and if you'd like to see our data, it's open. You guys can sit down one on one or whoever and go through the data. Well, I specifically asked Colin about it this afternoon. Good. And I was not satisfied with the answer. Thank you. You're welcome to sit with them and go through GIS data. Great. That's what you prefer. And, and Arnie, I see you have a question, but before, before that, let me just see, Dr. Barley, anything else okay. that you'd like to share or Paula in response to Mr. Gaines' question? I would like to work with you, Mr. Gaines. Paula, go ahead. Yeah, I would just add that um, for several of your, of your questions, sampling west of the fire training area, we do have groundwater sampling planned west of the fire training area. Um, and we can look at, our, at the plume maps out here whenever we're done here with the RAV, if you'd like, and we can go over those and I can show you where we're planning to sample west of the fire training area. There were a lot of other questions in there that <laughs> I don't, I, I can't recall, but uh, I'll be more than happy to, to go over that with you. Well, on the maps and show you where we're planning to sample. Mr. Gaines, does that sound like a, a path forward for you? Uh, yeah, as long as the, the, the data is, gets incorporated, that's my concern. I have, I have not to date seen it in the data. I and see. we are years into this. And so I would have expected that we'd have a more comprehensive picture hmm. on the table at this point in time. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And, and uh, Mr. Arno Lurich. Just a, a quick follow up on that. This sure. has been an action and, item. Since and if, the beginning. if you could focus towards the, the mic, just so folks can hear you. This has been an action item that Bill started two and a half years ago. And uh, Catherine, you did a great first step about six months ago. You produced a very detailed map, uh, which is a good start but it needs to be bigger and it needs to be updated and shared with the RAV uh, on a quarterly basis if there are changes, which a CSM would be a major change. In addition to that, the map has to have a list of the site names and so forth so that we can look for those in the more detailed reports if there's something that we have a question about or the public has a question about of how your recommendations fit with the reality of what's on the ground. And so I just throw that out. This is taking some good first steps, but I think that if we could follow up and work with you on that and maybe a technical review on this topic meeting with the RAB, I think we'd go a long way in accomplishing this. So. Any, any response I, I there? Um, let me just check in before going to you, David, uh, when uh, Dr. Barley, any, any response you'd like to share on that point? I look forward to continuing to advance what we're doing. So I'm writing down notes right now that I need to get a new updated IRP, AFFF, map out to everybody and look at those plumes and see if there's a good way to present them for you, Arnie. And Bill. Okay. It crosses into the training responsibility of the Air Force and the other agencies to the public and the RAP. 
Okay. It crosses into that. Okay. I'll just give it. All right. Thank you. Uh, David Wynn. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First thing is the uh, on the RI. Um, you you stated early in your presentation that you've done testing soil samplings in, in different areas and groundwater testing. What about the testing for the area north of where you plan on putting the IRA for Bennett Lake? Is that in, been tested yet or is that part of the test? That's a great question. Um, that is part of where we're going to go when we start our vertical aquifer sampling, the groundwater sampling. We all recognize that there's a data gap north of the IRA that we're planning at Bennett Lake. Uh, Ken Ratliff Memorial Park. So that's going to be a priority for us when we start the bass or the vertical aquifer sampling so that we can fill those groundwater data gaps up there and just and see what we may need to do in that area. But that is a focus for us and that is part of the work that we're going to be doing in the next few weeks. Will that affect anything relative to the current designs that you have? It will not affect anything relative to the current designs that we have. Okay. All right. Uh, second question I have. The uh, Clark's Marsh and RI um, comments that were made between Eagle and, and uh, uh, Air Force, when will those become public record? They're on the administrative record. I sent you guys an update that said that. So the, so the RI is out there as well? The uh, comments, well, not on the RI because the RI ones haven't been finalized. Okay, that's so, my question. Yeah, no, sorry. I think the IAR. <laughs> Catherine, I IAR. think he's talking about the comments on the proposed plan. Yeah, on the proposed for, plan. Yeah, I have the ones that you I have the ones that you sent out for the proposed plan. For the proposed plan. I have those. Yes. What I'm asking for is Clark's Marsh and the RI. And, so those have not been and, finalized. And, uh, let's so try to make sure that we're Clark's speaking Clark's one at a time for sorry. Quintina's benefit and, and her okay. her right. work well, fingers. Let me clarify. For Clark's Marsh, for both the IRAs. Eagle's comments are on the administrative record. If you're having problems finding them, let me know and I will get them for you. So for Clark's Marsh, they're out there. Yes, okay. both are on there. Okay. Okay. What about the RI? The do RI have comments idea? have not been finalized. Do you, do you so have any idea when that might be? As soon as we can start finalizing, um, we had. 198 comments to go through and we've been going through them in a stepwise fashion so every time we make a decision i go ahead and i put that into in a memo for record that's going on the ar on how we're moving forward and that's based off of comment resolutions that beth and i are coming to agreement with with our teams and that's the stepwise process that we're going down okay but I want to continue sharing information. So I shared groundwater data and Mark and I have had good conversations and hopefully that will continue. And if you have a concern, please bring it to my attention yeah. and we'll I just, it I just, I'm just curious as to when the, the comments will be available that we can review, that's all. Oh, all right. You've been more than generous in sharing the information. Um, for the Van Etten Lake IRA, the preliminary designs, are they complete? Are they in process? I put everything on hold when I came on board okay. because honestly, we need to make sure that we address every single comment and make sure that there's no design changes. So yes, we have ordered tanks because we figured that that was not changing because tank lead time was becoming, what was it, 12 months, Paula, or 18 months by the yeah, time a we lot of our, to, Yeah, a lot of our materials and supplies lead times right. were very long and things that we knew or were, were confident that that wouldn't change. We, we were looking at ordering those just so that we would have them and we'd be ready to go. So, but this, okay. we have the ability to pivot. We have the ability to change that. So, my, my question for my, my question for asking that question is the timeline that you put up there. If you just if I just heard you correctly, you said the tanks are 18 month lead time. They were. We paid for a rush turnaround. Okay. And we will get them by October. Okay. So. All I'm asking is. Is this timeline realistic based on where we currently are? If everything goes smooth. If everything goes as planned, if we're able to get Eagle the Rod in the next two weeks, then it's doable for your guys' review, assuming we're all in lockstep, which means everybody needs to be in lockstep, which means I'm going to be communicating everything we're doing all the, all the way through. Okay. Does Eagle agree with that? Um, I know there have been some 
this is Beth Place. I know there have been some preliminary discussions with our attorneys on the ARAR for the uh, Clark's Marsh IRA. And so I think that'll make it easier when we receive the draft document to review it. So um, I know both agencies' priority is to, to get the uh, interim remedies constructed and, and operational. So it sounds like there still could be some issues. Um, I don't think so with the record of decision. Um, we also have the remedial action work plan in house for the Clark's Marsh interim remedial action. And we will be providing our comments back to Air Force by September 13th. Okay. Mr. Wynn, uh, does that address the questions that you had or anything? Yeah, I mean, it addresses the question, but there's, I mean, like anything normal, there's, this is, you know, the best schedule that you have based on the date and time. Mm -hmm. This is the best we can do and this is best case. Right. This is what I'm aiming for. This is what I want. And, and here's, a, and you okay. need to understand why I'm asking this question. In the past, and this is before you, okay? The community has seen, I can't count on, on, on my fingers and toes, how many different timelines that we've seen have come and gone, all right? And if, if this is realistic or if it's in the ballpark, and from what I've seen so far, from just me personally, I think that you guys are very sincere about getting this thing moving and getting it going. My issue is, like I said, is what we've seen in the past for the last 12 years or whatever, right? We've seen timelines come and go and nothing get done. And all I'm asking is from a community standpoint is to make sure that we're doing the best we can and that if there are any hiccups or issues that they that the group sit down, resolve those issues so that we can move forward. All the community is looking for is these are IRAs to move forward and get installed and up and running. It's going to make everybody a heck of a lot happier and i know it'll make a lot of you as well so that's the reason for my asking absolutely and i look forward to working it with you okay thank you thank you right. sir well thank you very, very much uh mr Wynn. uh we're still in the rad member questions we will break uh, move to a break in about 20 minutes just for your awareness but let me check with the uh, rad members for other questions i see uh mr Wynn. i do have one more question and it's not relative to the iras the BCT main amendments, okay? Um, Beth mentioned in her, in her presentation that she's in the process of sending those BCT minutes back to the Air Force, okay? The last one that I understand is the, the record is February. So those BCT minutes is what the public looks at to be able to understand what's going on. My question to you is once Air Force receives those BCT meeting minutes, how long would you anticipate that you are going to need before those can go back to Eagle and those can get on the MPART website for the public to review? We'll turn those around as fast as possible. So those are two contractors. Our PBR contractor, Bay West, is now in the finishing up the documentation stage of their contract and our new BCOS contractor. So they will actively work those. They will get those done. I will stay on top of it. Um, okay. As I, would fast just, as possible. I would just ask that you do that because again the last ones that are out there from february and we're now in august so uh, again the, uh, those are in that's information the public uses to understand what goes on in the month to month meetings and the progress of this project so that makes yeah. sense and if you need anything along the way just ask okay thank you all right thank you very much other questions from the rad members I just got a question. Just I'm sorry, could you state your name real no, quick? Um, on the north side of the base, there is a place where the old KC 135 is stored after it's crashed. And there's also settlement bases. The settlement is all septic systems, sewer systems that have been very long there. Uh, there are soil samples and, and water samples in both those places taking place. So if I, I think I heard you say the KC-135 where that was stored, are you talking about the DRMO where it was stored up there? Yeah. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we have done soil sampling in the DRMO. Yes. Yeah. And the other one? There was a, there's the old settlement bases and the old sewer system 
on the north side of the basin. It's all been buried. It was there years ago. It's all been buried. I can point it out when I'm out there. I can start. Oh, I'm at 30, 31. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that I know where you're talking about. And I don't know if Catherine. Knows, so, knows yeah, so that's the site up in the LF3031 that Mark sent us all the data about. Oh, okay. and we've been working on scoping a project for LF3031. I believe it's falling through the cracks this year. It'll be picked up next year, but that's because we prioritized the removal of FTO2. And that is my highest priority. I want that to happen this year. We want to remove that source before it has a chance to impact Parks Marsh. Yes, sir. And Mr. Maxwell, does that address the question? Yeah. All right. Okay. Go ahead. Um, back in uh, July, when you gave us some technical meetings, um, you talked about me putting a map in the I've seen some uh, stuff that has been previously done very successfully, and the same kind of thing when you do um, pollution. Whatever happened to that idea? That idea is still on the table, sir. So first we need to get the capture under control so that we don't, so if we do removal of sand at the lakefront and go ahead and put down a clay mat and be able to cover it up that we aren't having more flow through. If we have capture already, then that mat's going to be more long lived and actually take care of the foam issues and treat the lake by more or less just flow through. So that one's still on the table. Um, CERTIP also came to me with a proposal recently that I think we might try a three pipe stitch, Ben, right? So it's a flow, it's the same thing, very similar concept. It's a flow through mat. And if it works there, that would be the verification we need to be able to put it somewhere else. Okay. Other questions from RAD members? Yes, go ahead. I do. Um, so yesterday was the public comment period for the IRA for Vanetton Lake, and I made some comments that were created by community members in, in addition to an um, environmental group that we partnered with. And I would like to have those comments for the sake of not repeating them all tonight um, submitted to this meeting if possible. Is that is that possible? As, as comments from the community. Hmm. So as part of a resp the response for the presentation. So last night's well. will be posted online. This one will as well. Um, you can always reread if you want to. I don't know. We, I mean, we could attach it to meeting minutes or. It's however you'd like to proceed. Uh, certainly, if you decided to reread during the public comment period, it would be captured in, in that, at that time. But Dr. Marley, I defer to you on, on whether that would conform to the I'm good with whatever yeah. mark it preference. doesn't matter to me Kathy whatever you want to do um it looks like we have many of the same people that were here last night <laughs> today um so formally I'm just not unsure of the process of what you prefer but I would like to have those comments submitted as part of the community Why speaking on the that time <laughs> You can read them. I don't know if you want to do it now or in public comments. During public comments, right? I would right? suggest during public yeah. comments. Okay. And so I'll add you to the, the list okay. um, of public comments. And, and okay. just for awareness, that was Kathy Wisterbarth uh, speaking just there. Sorry. No harm with it. Okay. Right? Does that, does that work, okay. Kathy? Yes. Great. Okay. Other questions from the RAD members? Ms. Billerich. Uh, as part of the uh, presentation that you gave, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to ask as an action item that in that Air Force presentation part of the future RATS, that you talk about the reports that and the status of those reports. It could be just a slide with the detail, not that much talking unless there's some highlight that needs to happen, like the BCT minutes. Uh, the uh, the remedial action operational report, some of them are over two years uh, old. And so I think that would be a very important uh, add to the RAB and to the community to see what reports, where they are, how quickly things are moving along. They'll understand what's being discussed 
hear a lot more. So that's an action All item. All right, hold on. Before we make that an action item, what I'm trying to do is what I'm trying to get organized, first of all. I'm still fairly new to this, so give me a second. But one of the first things that we decided to do is start putting together a tracker. And that tracker is being put together now for the beginning of every BCT. We're going to start sending that out to the RAB members as well. So you'll have that in real time. You don't have to worry about waiting until a RAB meeting for that. Because we're reading for BCT meetings more often than we are for RAB a lot of the times, right? The, so the reports are not on the action item tracker. No, but I we're working on putting that together, sir. That's what I'm telling you. I'm working on that. Okay. So we're going to have that soon, as well as a calendar of what we're doing when. So we're we're working on getting organized. I just need a little bit more time. If you could be a little I understand. bit more patient. This is not a complaint for you, for sure. Not for you. This is something that's historical. Fine. But the AR, when it's updated, we need to be notified when there is an update. Otherwise, we don't know to go there. Are you reading the emails I'm sending you? Of course I am. They're in there every time, I tell you. That's only recently. But in the information this repository at the yeah, library. Okay, let's, let's let Mr. Lurich finish up his, his thought. Go ahead. So I think it, we can have a more detailed discussion, but the information repository has fallen down over the last 18 months and being updated. So the public does not have that uh, method of going there and reading if they don't have a computer or they just want to see the maps and so forth in more detail. So, uh, so that's a joint effort between the community grab and the, uh, the Air Force. Um, I, I'd like to add to the presentation you gave a report that has not been discussed in maybe three to six months. And so I'd like to know the status of this. And that's the five year, the fifth five-year review and it's my understanding that a five-year review is a look back for five years on the performance of actions records of decisions GAC units uh, other things that have been required to be installed or tracked or whatever and uh, that report is coming up on two years overdue on the 30th of this month. And so the first question is, I'd like to know the status of that and when we're going to actually get it uh, for final or review, whichever the process is. The second part is, I asked at the last meeting or the one before that, that it's my understanding that a five-year review includes an evaluation of all those records of decisions and, and GAC units like the FTO2 uh, an evaluation of the protectiveness to human health, the environment, and also in addition to, was it is it meeting the uh, purpose of that record of decision for that equipment? And I was told that for PFAS, five-year review does not include a protectiveness. And I'd like to just add to the record I found just this weekend, the Navy says, at a site in the East Coast, their five-year review will also consider, that's due in November of this year, will have a PFAS protectiveness. So I don't know how much you want to talk about that now. Will yours include that? And what is So the first of all, I'm still fairly new. I prioritize field work. So we are working on documents, but we are working on field work and getting into the field faster than anything else, right? We want results. It's time to do work. Once we hit winter, we'll have time to do document reviews, work on additional work plans, move other things forward. So we'll be ready for next field season, right? We are working on the five-year review. It has gone back and forth with legal. The uh, protectiveness statement is something that has to be approved by our approved by Air Force, right? Before it can actually go forward. So it is taking longer, but it also is not the highest priority at this point in time. And the reason being is field work is important. If we don't have field work, we don't have data to analyze over the winter. If we don't have data over the winter, we are not ready for next year. So I'm trying to be results driven. And that's my goal, but we will get to it, Arnie. I promise. We're just not there yet. So Eagle has not seen it yet. I don't believe so. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.
thank you for the question, sir. Other other questions from the RAD members? Yes, sir, Mr. Henry. Just a, a follow-up, Mark Henry. Um, will that um, upcoming five-year review when it's done have a protectiveness statement? That you all? Anticipate it? This is Sharon Brzezinga. This is Sharon Brzezinga for the Air Force. Can I take that one, please? Go ahead, Sharon. Five-year reviews talk to rods that are already in place, remedies that are in place. You make protectiveness determinations based on remedies that are in place. So all of the remedies that are in place and have decision documents at Wurtsmith will be evaluated in the five-year review. That includes interim rods if we have interim rods when the five-year review are done is done. If we have a site where there's a final record of record of decision, but maybe there's PFAS on there, we know there's PFAS on there, but we don't have a record of decision for that, we will evaluate whether the remedy is protective in the short term versus in the long term since we won't have a PFAS remedy in place. That's how that's being handled with PFAS on Air Force installations across the country. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, in just a moment, real quick, and let me just make sure, Mark, did that address your question? Um, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Arnie, go ahead. To Sharon, uh, across the country for the Air Force, I'm sure that was part of the answer you gave, is it also across DOD branches, DOD-wide, enterprise-wide? The way the five-year review for PFAS protecting this and this five-year review is going to be done. I don't advise the Navy and the Army, so I can't give you a definitive answer on that. I can tell you how it's being handled across the Air Force, and it's what I stated previously. I think we're being consistent with the other services, but again, I do not advise them, so I cannot speak for them. Okay. So is this the first one for the for PFAS for the Air Force? Because oh, good night, no. We've no. been handling PFAS across the United States at other bases and former bases. So it's coming up in five-year reviews. So this is the only one that's overdue. Well, no, know. sir, it's not. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, Sharon, thank you for your comments. Anything else you'd like to add on that point? Go ahead, Ms. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any, we have uh, about seven minutes or so till our scheduled break. Any other RAD member questions at the moment? Yes, go ahead, Beth Place. Okay. Beth Place with Eagle. Um, I just wanted to follow up on Mr. Gaines's question about the conceptual site model. And I wondered if something Eagle has asked for along the way. I know Colin, when he sits down and shows you the map of the locations and the plumes, um, it's easy to understand, but it would be would it be helpful to the RAB to have figures in place that have the older locations um, as points along with the plume maps, something like that that you guys could refer to. I don't know if that's something Catherine could provide to you. That's why we're going to the bench. You and I are thinking the same. Okay, good. Okay. okay. All right, other... Other questions from the RAB members at the moment? Yes. Okay, Beth Place again. I had one more. I thought what Sharon said on the call, but I wasn't quite sure if I caught it right, was that if PFAS is on one of the IRP sites with a remedy that's being reviewed in the five year review, that there will be short term and long term protectiveness statements for PFAS. Is that correct? Sharon, can you answer? Just confirming. I had to unmute myself. It's a little unwieldy with the telephone. <laughs> what I was saying, and this gets convoluted, but if the remedy that's in place, let's say, is for TCE, but we have data on PFAS and we know that we have exceedances or something, you know, by then we've got RI data or we've got the SI data or whatever, we look at whether the remedy that's already in place is protective in the short term also for PFAS. For example, often there are land use controls on a site that prohibit groundwater use. 
if the PFAS is in the groundwater, even though we don't have a long-term remedy in place for PFAS yet, we can say that the remedy is protective in the short term if there's a land use control that prohibits groundwater use because of the TCE contamination. Those are the sorts of things we're looking at. Thank you, Sharon. Mm -hmm. Any other RAD member questions at the moment? I have a, yes. another procedural question, I think. Okay. Um, I got, Mr. Barth. <laughs> the, um, the report that I referenced in the, in the short summary that I gave, I'd, I'd like that also to be submitted as part of the RAB. I did provide that to um, Dr. Varley via email um, about a week ago. So I'd like to have that included. And, and sorry for clarity, do you mean included in in the transcript of, of, of tonight's it, meeting? Whether it's an attachment or, or however you would like to do that. I, see. And I mean, it's a, you know, it's a 15 page report. So. Right, right, yeah. Co-chairs, any ideas on how you'd like to address that? Any ideas? Well, it hasn't really been read at a, re at a meeting, so, um, at any formal meeting, mm -hmm. and so putting it as an attachment to the uh, to the RAB meeting may not be appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, reading it during the meeting, during towards the end of the meeting, um, at least a summary of it, uh, maybe with a reference to the document or where that document could be found, might be more in line with things. I. Agree. I haven't read it yet. I apologize. I'm still behind my reading list, but <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm getting there. Um, so hopefully over the next week or two, I can read it. But if you'd like to read portions of it and then tell us where to find it, that would be awesome. I can do that. Right. And um, and I'd also ask the Air Force to um, make a response to that report since so much effort was taken to um, sum summarize and find out all the information we'd like to have a response similar to how the state responded in terms of just formally letting us know what you think of the report. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, this is Sharon Brzinga. Uh, Ms. Wooster-Barth, why are you asking the Air Force to make a formal response to a public report? Well, because as um, Dr. Varley had mentioned, we're partners in, in this process, and so we would like to have some feedback on on what they think the uh, direction that we're going with um, all the work that we're doing and if there's any feedback that we need to consider in terms of you know changing directions. So I'll give you my two cents even without fully going through it yet. So I might have more to add later. Mm -hmm. So with the grain salt is right now I have been focused on the here and now and then moving us into the future. What is our long-term game plan? How do we actually make things happen now quickly and keep that momentum up? And I do need everybody in this room as well as everybody online to help us with that process. Um, history is good because it teaches us where we came from. Mm -hmm. But with that in mind, we also don't want to dwell on the history too much because that might actually hold us back from moving forward. So it's everything in perspective, if we do this as a team and we move forward in the right direction, then there's no reason why we can't clean up these big sites. There's no reason that we can't complete the RI in two years. There's no reason that we can't move on to an FS and start putting real, you know, long-term remedies in place. So I'm trying to take a big vision to it. I know that there's been a lot of piecemeal throughout the years. Um, I like to, Start with right here. Where are we right now? How do we speed things up? And then how do we keep that going? So hopefully we can all do that together. And I will read it. Trust me. We'll get there. Right. And thank you. And Kathy, for your awareness, I just I, I've been keeping track of those who would like to make a comment during public comment, and you are on that list. Okay. Uh, I also have uh, first off Anthony Spaniola. He had made it a a indicated via the chat function of the online meeting that he would like to make a comment. So when we start public comment, Tony, I'll turn to you first, then to Kathy Wooster-Barth, 
I'll then read, um, I'll, there is a statement that Jennifer Hill has asked to be read during the public comment period. So I'll check with the co-chairs about how they'd like to proceed on that during the break. Um, we are at uh, 6.20 Eastern, and so scheduled for a 10-minute break. Um, does that work to go ahead and, and proceed for the agenda with the 10-minute break? Okay, well, so uh, again, thank you for your patience. Let's go into a 10-minute break. Please go ahead and stop the microphones during this 10-minute break. 6.21 now, we'll come back at 6.31 Eastern. Thank you.
Hey, Tim, are you there where you can hear me? I can hear you. This is Gina. Hey, Gina, I just wanted to ask Tim to let me clarify a comment when we come back. Are you there with him? You're not, are you? No, but I can send him a text real quick. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Okay, I'll do that right now. Thank you. Um, we will turn in just a moment to a clarification of comment with Sharon Bersinga, Air Force attorney. But just a reminder to the RAB members, 
uh, please do. Um, we are getting a bit of feedback on the mics, uh, maybe by rustling papers near them or having uh, phones on vibrate uh, nearby. So uh, please just try to avoid impacting those mics. And again, thank you very much for your patience with, with this setup. Um, let's uh, first turn to Sharon Bersinga for a comment, and then we'll go to wrap number questions. So Sharon. Hi, hi, thanks, Tim. This is Sharon. I just wanted to uh, clarify what how I answered Beth's question a minute ago because I want to make sure I didn't mishear it. We will be looking at short-term protectiveness regarding PFAS in the upcoming five-year review for sites that already have remedies in place. So if there is a site that has PFAS contamination that we're investigating in the RI, but there is not a remedy already in place for another contaminant on that site, it will not be evaluated in the five-year review. So Beth, I just wanted to follow up and make sure I hadn't said something to mislead you on that score. Thank you, Tim. Great, thank you very much. And Beth, please, does that address the question that you had? Yes, thank you, Sharon. Great, all right, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, let's see, Mr. Bill Gaines had a question. And so Sarah, if you could, uh, let's move back to one of the first map slides in the presentation that we just viewed. Uh, Mr. Gaines, does that one work for you? That one works just fine. Uh, I challenge anyone here to read anything in any legend on that slide. And I realize that there are some folks on, on the phone who are having a bit of difficulty hearing uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so, Mr. Gaines, you made the point that you've made before, which is just the importance of having legible uh, graphics and documents for RAB meetings, correct? Yeah. Uh, if you're going to talk about something, you ought to be able to discern what it is that you present. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. And I, I see Kathy Wisterbarth has a, a question as well. I do have a, a comment just related to maps. There's a really great new map out there. Uh, it's beautiful. It doesn't have a date on it though. So dates are really helpful for us when we're trying to track when things are happening. Mm -hmm. So if those can be considered in the future maps that are created. Great, okay, thank you. And we're still in the RAB member questions. Let's go to that slide. Uh, Mr. Arnold Rich with a question. Just a quick follow up to Sharon's clarification on her response. For a layperson, the FTO2 is had an interim uh, rod. And therefore, and it was in this period that's covered by the five year review, and it was for PFO and PFOS. So, for that one instance, how is this five year review going to reflect the protectiveness for PFOS or PFO or PFOS? This is Are Sharon Brzezinga. I'm not. Go ahead, Sharon. Arnie, I'm not sure I'm understanding your question correctly, but if there is an IROD in place when we do the five year review, the IROD will be the, the remedy and the IROD will be evaluated for protectiveness in the five year review. Does that, any, any someone experts around me here to give me a nod? Is, I don't know. Maybe later we can talk about. This is Beth Place. Um, so, are you asking if, in the five-year review, if FTO2 will will have a PFAS pr protectiveness statement? It will. I'm asking if that's what you're asking. Oh, Sharon. That's what my question is to her. To Sharon. Okay. And outside of the IRA, correct? So the. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, it was an IRA in 2014. Okay. The, the current new one, right. That one is different. It's outside of five years. So Dr. Barley, is there any further clarification needed on that point? Do you think? Okay, so I don't know how to answer this. So Sharon, if you could answer, will FTO2 have a PFAS determination? Based on the first interim action 
uh, rod that was issued in 2014 and operational in 15. Just that interim action, not the one that's being reviewed now. Based on the 2014 interim action. Karen? Well, Mr. Larish, to be honest with you, I don't know it hardly anything about that interim action from 2014. If there's an IROD in place for it, though, we'll be evaluating that, and it, it'll follow what I said. And, and also, quite frankly, by the time we get a five-year review, you're going to have a Clark's Marsh IROD out in for this action. So we'd be evaluating that. But you're going to be evaluating whether the interim remedy is protective till you get to a final remedy is how you're going to be doing it. All right, I've okay. got additional information from another one of our team members. The There was no IROD for FTO2. FTO2 was a TICRA action. It was a removal action. It was time critical. Okay. We can talk oh, about Oh, we're talking about when the FTO, okay, that's what, yeah, the time critical removal actions don't have to be covered in records of this in five-year reviews, and I don't remember off the top of my head if they usually are or not, but it's final decision documents, like records of decision that are evaluated in five-year reviews. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Sharon. We appreciate that. Uh, Mark Henry had a comment. And well, then we'll it go was to uh, surrounding this uh, rod review thing. It would mm -hmm. seem that the interim remedial action that we just commented on is about to be implemented. That the rod for for that would supersede the previous rod, mm -hmm. and it would be starting its five-year cycle all over again mm -hmm. when that rod is issued. That's just how I envision it. I see. Okay. Thank you. And David Wynn. Yeah, I have a question. No, this is Sharon. Just to clarify that, five-year review clocks don't reset. So it, a five-year review by statute, you go five years from when the first remedial action was taken on a base or a former base, and you trigger five years off of that every time. We don't reset the clock when the actions restart. I, I can think of one very odd scenario where a clock got reset. But usually they stay almost without fail. They don't get reset. So whatever timeline we've been on, which we may very well be late, I don't remember for this space, we're still on that timeline, even though we're late meeting it. Okay. Right. Thank you for that comment, Sharon. And I see David Wynn has a question. Yeah, I have a question. Paul, I think this is, would probably be directed towards you. On both of the Clark's Marsh IRA as well as Van Etten Lake IRA, how are you are the performance objectives established as part of the design, or is that something that you guys wait till you you basically, and I'm going to put get a dart in the wall and, and say okay this is our going to be our objective, and then once the the system is started up, then you try to improve the performance. Or do you guys establish those performance objectives up front? No, that's a, a great question. Um, the way that we look at the IRAs and the performance monitoring, um, I know we have we see, received several comments on performance monitoring on the Clark's Marsh uh, proposed plan. So we know that's important. We have to do performance monitoring so that we can ensure that the hydraulic control system that we have just installed is actually controlling the migration of groundwater. So, and I think in the proposed one, I think I know in the proposed plan for both, it says that we're going to monitor up gradient and down gradient monitoring wells to evaluate the performance or the efficiency of that hydraulic control system. So, when we actually select where we're going to put those um, performance monitoring wells up and down gradient, once all of the comments have been received on the proposed plan and those have been evaluated by the Air Force and any um, uh, changes or updates have made. Once that is final, then we can uh, finalize or, or move into finalizing the work plan or the final designs for the treatment system because the Air Force does evaluate all comments that, that, that they receive on the proposed plans. So those designs aren't finalized until that process is over and any changes made. So once the designs are then finalized, then we can look at the performance monitoring, where we're going to go, upgrade it, downgrade it, all along the hydraulic control line and the best locations that we think we need to get to to monitor that. 
So those, those details really aren't finalized until after everything else is done and we're ready to go. And we'll use those monitoring wells to enhance the performance of the treatment system, like Jim mentioned uh, last night and, and posters are out in the lobby. We use all that data to continuously tweak and make sure that the system is running as efficient as possible. And that's why we have to have um, some engineering safety factors in there. We talked about uh, flow rates last night so that we can we have the ability to change that as we need to. And the performance monitoring will help us decide if this well needs to be pumped faster, this one needs to be pumped slower, and tweak that in so that we are really operating efficiently the system and to ensure that we are in fact capturing hydraulically controlling that portion of the plant. So those control. did I hear you correctly that so at the after the designs are at the end of the design time. Mm -hmm. you will have established the performance objectives so that yes. when you I'm the sorry. system is installed and up running up and running mm -hmm. you compare those performance objectives is is a design as to what you actually have and tweak them accordingly right yes and i'm sorry i didn't answer your question i, I realized that okay. uh, when you said that yeah but the performance objectives are actually established during um, during the design and then finalized in the work plan so that's where okay. they're actually documented as okay. well measuring ourselves against and obviously for the hydraulic control are we controlling them the flow and that the flow and that will be realized by contaminant trends and downgrading the wells are they going down are they staying the same are they going up and we need multiple wells to check those trends in different places to make sure that we uh really have a handle on that and then we can evaluate the system treatment efficiency like i said tweak higher okay. lower whatever but yeah, but that will be in the work plan, the actual performance objectives. Is Eagle in agreement with that? Yes, um, we're in agreement that we'll be discussing the performance monitoring okay. and the remedial action work plan. Thank you. All right, thank you, David. We appreciate your question. Any other RAD member questions? Anything else from the RAD members? Okay, well, let's move to the next slide then, if we could. And Paula, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. <laughs> Great, so now we're in the public comment portion of the meeting. And uh, the RAD members so far in the meeting have had the opportunity to meet, to uh, address questions, have some discussion. And we're now opening the floor to members of the public who are not RAB members, um, but who would like to make comments to the RAB. Um, for those who are here in person, if you would like to make a comment, I'll ask you in a moment to come up to the microphone stand that we have to your left. Um, and for those who are participating remotely, I will ask you to raise your hand electronically and then I'll call on you. We'll unmute you. You may have to unmute yourself and then you can make a comment. Um, when I do call on your name, uh, Sarah will make sure that you're you're not muted, and then you'll have three minutes to make your comment. Um, I do have a list of those who have, have signed up first. The first is Anthony Spaniola, and so let's make sure that Anthony Spaniola is unmuted, if we could. And I see you've unmuted yourself as well, so uh, Mr. Spaniola, we'll turn to you for three minutes, sir. Thank you, Tim. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, we can. Thank you. I would just like to, uh, first of all, uh, there was a discussion about the history and, and uh, action and moving forward. And uh, Dr. Varley, I, I want to thank you for your focus on action uh, and your efforts to, um, I think, bring a, a new approach here. Uh, it's, it's welcome. Um, I do think, however, that the history is very important because it shows a mindset mindset not just of the various project managers or and predecessors to you dr varley but of the entire air force and those that have been in charge uh, at the highest levels of this uh cleanup over the last over a decade period and from those of for those of us who've been involved for a lengthy period of time in that that mindset uh isn't going to we're not going to be convinced that that mindset has changed until we see real and meaningful action and as we sit in the tail end here of the uh, public comment 
for the Manhattan Lake IRA, there's a real perception and concern that whoever is making these decisions is not going into this with an open mind when it comes to the Bennett and Lake IRA and the, the comment that has been out there from the community and from Need Our Water and others, including our U.S. Senator, for the need to extend the extraction field to the north. We've been told that there are data gaps and we have experts on our team who are telling us that that is not in fact the case. And we also have history that tells us that in April of 2020, we were told by the Air Force that they didn't have enough data to even do an IRA at Clark's Marsh or to do an IRA at Bennett and Lake. And suddenly when Congressman Kildee went to the Pentagon, suddenly we had enough data. And so the concern that we have is that this project over and over and over again, corners have been cut and, and efforts have not been taken to properly manage and, and deal with the full extent of contamination when we know we have a problem. We know we have maps, not only from Eagle, but also from the Air Force. And so my concern, and I think many others share this, is that we're here at the end of a public comment period. This has been going on for more than a year. The Air Force has not explained adequately why it's not addressing the, the additional contaminant plume. And now is the time to do it. And we were told money wasn't gonna be an issue, but my suspicion, my strong suspicion is that money is driving this and that, uh, and that the Air Force really just doesn't wanna do it. So I'm, I'm asking for action. I'm asking for action to make that happen. Thank you. Hey, Tony, we're, so right now we're in the middle of doing the RI, right? We've already started, we got the gears rolling and we are collecting data. <clears throat> We are closing those data gaps as fast as we can. And as we close those data gaps, we will be programming to take care of any human health um, concerns or any ecological concerns. Um, Paula, would you like to add to this comment? Yes, I would, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I would like to say, and this has come up in conversations that I've had with a, a few folks over the last couple of days, you know, why we're not going further north with the IRA at Van Etten Lake. And data gaps is one of the, the reasons that we're not moving moving the line further north. We are in the process, like Dr. Varley mentioned, of looking at that in the IRA or the RI to fill those data gaps. There's also a couple other things, and I'll kind of quickly elaborate on those. When we began this project, when the Air Force came to us and said, we want to do an IRA here. Let's look at what, what we have. What, what is the best option to cut off the higher concentrations of PFAS and PFOA that are moving into Van Etten Lake at Ken Ratliff Memorial Park? And we've all seen the figures and, and we have them here and you can clearly see where that area is, where those highest concentrations are. So that is what the Air Force wanted to focus on was cutting off those higher concentrations that, uh, that higher risk area. So that's what we tried to focus on. When we built the central treatment system in 2018, as, as most of you know, that treatment system was built um, to house a second treatment train on the other side, and that was already in place. So when the Air Force asked us, how, what's the, the fastest way that we can do this to get some action to, to, to mitigate the issues there at, at Bennett Lake at Ken Ratliff Memorial Park. We're like, well, we already have the central treatment system in place. It was built to expand. Let's take advantage of that and, and use that to, to wrap into the IRA. So when we looked at that, the, the sizing of the central treatment system that's already there, the, the treatment capacity that we have in the existing train is 500 gallons a minute. Again, we're talking about capacity here. Sorry, I hope you guys can hear me. Talking about capacity. And then it was designed to handle another 500 gallons a minute on the other side. So with the 500 gallon a minute capacity that we have and the IRA that we're looking at, the 12 wells that we're proposing in the proposed plan will use the capacity of the central treatment system. So if we, the data gaps is one and the capacity that we have in the central was the other reason for not moving that forward. And it's not that um, we, we were looking for the, the quickest way to mitigate that issue of those higher concentrations of PFOS and PFOA. And this is the quickest way to get action 
is to use the existing infrastructure that was already there for the purpose that it was meant for. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, that's kind of why we're not moving forward uh, with advancing that further to the north. One of the um, uh, discussions that we had last night, Jim Romer, who's the design engineer for both of the IROs, had mentioned that as part of the design, we are adding in one additional blank so that if based on operational data, if we can add another well, that might be possible depending on how the system operates as we get it up and running. Depending on our optimizations that we do, maybe we can add another well and that, that additional capacity will not overwhelm what we already have going into the CTS. So we do have um, some capacity from the original train because we're not actually pumping at 500 gallons a minute right now. So we could use that, but we need to get the system up and running to see what we could do if we needed to add another well. But again, that that will not be, we won't be able to determine that until the system is actually operational. So well, hopefully that answers, answers well, the question. Well, the key question. thing is the purpose, right, of the IRA. The purpose of the IRA is to protect human health and the risk address hydraulic control, hydraulic capture at the most severe areas. And that beach is a serious issue. I've seen people out there. You know, we do want to take care of that as fast as possible. This is what we can get done as soon as possible. This year, it's my goal, this year. Now, that requires a lot of things to fall in place, and that requires us all to work together. But that is a goal. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, Paula, anything else you would wanted to add there? No? no not okay. Thanks. All right. And Ms. Maniola, thank you for your, your comment. Um, we'll now turn next on my list uh, is uh, Kathy Wooster. So, Kathy, would you like to make, make a comment? Yes. <clears throat> so, um, what it sounded like um, you had asked me to do during public comment was to both summarize the public comments of the IRA, the Venet and Lake IRA, like I did last night, so that they can get into the public record here in the meeting, and then also the report that now in um, National Wildlife Federation had um, released last week. So I'll start with the IRA comments from the public, um, the, now, the NOW group and its experts. The proposed plan describes the actions planned by the Air Force's Base Realignment and Closure Program Office, the Air Force, to reme remediate to a limited degree the contamination entering Venet and Lake. The proposed plan describes interim actions as defined under the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation and Liability Act of 1980, CERCLA. Interim actions at a surplus site, such as the former base, are intended to rapidly address situations where an imminent and substantial endangerment of the human health or the environment from contaminants, pollutants, or hazardous chemicals is occurring. In the case of Manhattan Lake, PFAS substances contamination emanating from the base and discharging through groundwater into Manhattan Lake has contaminated the waters of the lake, the biota, and created PFAS-contaminated foam. This contamination of biota has resulted in state-issued health advisories limiting consumption of fish from the lake, a do not ingest the foam advisory, as the advisories are not enforceable and are impossible to monitor for compliance, the level of contamination in the animals is resulting in unacceptable human exposure to the PFAS, PFO, excuse me, PFOS, and possibly other PFAS found in biota. Also, foam contact and ingestion by citizens is not preventable by the authorities. The PFAS foam also contains a suite of PFAS chemicals that fit the circular definition of contaminant or pollutant. Additionally, the extent of groundwater contamination and potential human exposure from the plumes impacting the, the Ken Ratliff Memorial Park area may extend into the other side of Manhattan Lake where very similar PFAS contamination is impacting drinking water wells along the lake. The proposed plan is to double the treatment capacity of the central treatment system, the CTS plant, excuse me, currently treating plumes along Arrow Street and in the area of the former fuel storage tank, tank system. The plan includes a new groundwater extraction field paralleling F41. 
the new well field extraction system will capture 503 gallons per minute of PFAS contaminated groundwater that will be direct, directed to the central treatment plant. The treatment water will be discharged to Benetton Creek. The discharge is controlled by a substantive requirement document, SRD, created by Eagle that limits the discharge of PFAS to 12 parts per trillion as a monthly average with a 15 parts per trillion daily maximum discharge. Other than PFOS and PFOA, no other PFAS in the discharge are regulated by the SRD. The remedy described in the proposed plan does not provide a rationale for the width of the groundwater collection groundwater extraction system. The contraction system, excuse me, the extraction system does not cover the known heart of the PFAS plumes entering Benetton Lake at the Ratliff Park Beach, but does not extend to the excuse me, not, does not extend to the known width of PFOS plume that exceeds part 201 groundwater surface water interface criteria of 12 parts per trillion. Also, the Air Force does not document the extent of other PFAS contaminants in the plume that are also discharging to the lake that are known to be to biomagnify in fish and preferentially partition to foam on the lake. The Air Force's proposed plan would increase the amount of groundwater capture and treat, treated from 320 gallons per minute to 823 gallons per minute. The total treatment capacity will be 1,000 gallons per minute when the expansion of the system is complete. Treatment of the additional captured plume would be either by activated carbon or by ion exchange resin Either technology will treat the PFAS contamination in the groundwater to below the SRD requirements. The preferred alternative, alternative presented in the plan is to use activated carbon. And we include 12 technical comments with slides and images. And so I will move to the summary. Now, in summary, now's comments are number one, activated carbon as a treatment technology appears to be the correct choice of treatment using the nine circular balancing criteria for choosing a remedy. Number two, the Air Force should present and explain to the public and elected officials the plan for future monitoring of the remedy described in the proposed plan. Also, the Air Force does not present the other PFAS chemicals and plumes and likely the central treatment plan inflow Influent will be a mix of these PFAS chemicals. Is carbon treatment able to remove all of the PFAS contaminants and pollutants that will be entering the system? Will there be illegal discharges of other PFAS than PFOS and PFOA in the treatment effluent? Under the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, the dischargers of effluent must disclose all chemicals that may enter the surface waters and they must disclose the expected concentration and volume of such discharges. Is the Air Force making such disclosures when submitting the request for an SRD for this new discharge? Now is not confident that the Air Force's remedial site team accurately understands the site contamination. This conceptual site model that the Air Force presents to the public clearly lacks a great deal of information that is known to EGLE. Now is not certain if the Air Force team understands the site or if this seemingly lack of understanding is just the legacy of previous Air Force site teams and lack of institutional knowledge. The current team should not repeat the same mistakes and should present a coherent conceptual site model for the Ratliff area plume. Number three of six comments. The Air Force needs to present all of the data and the full extent of contamination to the public and elected officials in understandable ways. There is no law that prevents the Air Force from informing the public and elected officials of data gathered by others, nor is the Air Force presented from presenting all the technical data, not just PFOA and PFOS, as the other chemicals meet the definition of contaminants or pollutants or may so designated in, near future, in the near future. The Air Force needs to present all of the information that points to st substantial contamination of humans from base contamination to the health departments, the Veterans Administration, and the ATSDR. Number four, the Air Force should expand the proposed plan footprint to the north of the current proposed extraction well field along F-41. 
waiting years to act while more study of the problem is undertaken is unnecessary. This is a situation where there is a clear, imminent, and substantial endangerment of the public and the environment. More study is not going to make the known plume stop discharging into Benetton Lake. Now affirms its concurrence with the Eagle's request with Eagle's request for additional interim actions at the entire site. Now cannot affirm the locations discussed in the March 23rd, 2021 letter to the Air Force for Remediation and Redevelopment Division Director Neller, as the reference map is not included in the copy of the letter provided to the public. But now that there are multiple areas around the base that pose imminent and substantial endangerment to the public. The Air Force has been entrusted with the responsibility to protect human health and the environment. CERCLA provides the Air Force with the tools to carry out that responsibility. CERCLA is not designed to prevent responsible behavior as the Air Force seems to believe by its actions and statements. The Air Force can address any contaminant or pollutant released at the site and can do so at any time if the contamination presents an imminent and substantial endangerment. The Air Force response is not limited by CERCLA to address only PFOS and PFOA with interim actions or CERCLA removal actions. The last point, the, S, the Air Force needs to start monitoring the impacts of PFAS on the biota and the ecosystem in Bennett and Lake. Monitoring of biota will document the effects of Air Force remedial actions over time and inform decisions made at Wordsmith and other sites across the nation. It should be understood by everyone that this interim action, while helpful towards a final cleanup of Annette and Lake, is incomplete as even a short-term solution, and that much more effort is needed to reduce the impacts on the lake and citizens. However, overall, now is pleased that the Air Force has doubled the treatment capacity of the Central Treatment System plant and is cutting off much of the plumes that discharge at Ken Ratliff Memorial Park. All right, thank you very much, Kathy. Where do we find that? Well, this this is the the public comment letter for the public comment period for the IRA. Now that was sent to um, uh, Dr. Barley and and to the state, and of course will be submitted formally. Um, excuse me, this has not been sent to you. The, the report has. So okay. sorry, this this will be sent by the deadline. <laughs> okay, via email and and through through mail. Um, and of course, we can provide that to anyone that requests it after that. I'll probably post it online on our Facebook page or something. So um, now the the report that um, you know we also are going to be having available online. The title of that report is PFAS contamination at the former Wordsmith Air Force Base: The True Story. It's setting the record straight about what the Air Force, the Department of Defense, and the State of Michigan have actually done or not done protect people and natural resources in Oscoda, 1974 through 2021. And I'm gonna just read off the, I'm gonna summarize the introduction. The US military's heavy and longstanding use of aqueous film forming foam has contributed to one of the worst environmental crises of our time. For over 50 years, the US military has used AFFF containing high concentrations of toxic chemicals called PFAS. PFAS are a family of chemicals that are extraordinarily toxic and persistent in the environment. They have been linked to cancer, kidney disease, and numerous birth and developmental disorders. Also known as forever chemicals, PFAS are widespread in the environment because they take decades to break down, and many tend to bioaccumulate in people, fish, and wildlife. Moreover, PFAS are exceptionally numerous. There are thousands of individual PFAS compounds and their durability and resistance to water, oils, and heat make them ubiquitous in both commercial and industrial settings. And then it goes on to talk about um, when P PFAS were first discovered at the former Wordsmith Air Force Base um, over two decades ago. And from the 1970s until the, at least the base closure in 1993, the Air Force sprayed PFAS-laden AFFF at Wordsmith during training exercises to extinguish fires and regularly disposed of spent AFFF in grassy areas of the base. It should come to no surprise that these activities cause massive groundwater contamination, and contamination is running largely unchecked through the Ascoda area due, the, 
due to the Air Force's failure to control and clean up the PFAS plumes from the base. The Air Force has known about the toxic nature of PFAS since the early 1970s. Despite this knowledge, the Air Force has been extremely slow to address the de devastating effects of its historic discharges of AFFF at Wordsmith. When it has responded, the Air Force has taken inadequate actions that have only worsened the public crisis in Oscoda. Adding insult to injury, the Air Force has repeatedly attempted to assure Wordsmith veterans and Oscoda residents that it takes their health and its own cleanup responsibilities seriously. In doing so, the Air Force has hidden behind tax, excuse me, lax federal guidelines and denied its need to comply with Michigan's stricter standards. The state of Michigan actions have also been deficient. Although the state has played a significant role in uncovering the extent of PFAS contamination at Wordsmith, it has frequently been slow, opaque, and ineffective in warning Michiganders of the dangers of exposure to PFAS contamination from Wordsmith. Furthermore, because its attempt to push back on the Air Force, positions have been weak or unavailing, and the state has generally failed to use the strict PFAS cleanup standards that it developed over the past few years to its advantage. Despite their dubious track records, protecting public health in Oscoda, both the Air Force and the state of Michigan have often defended and even praised their own actions, even when those actions have resulted in delays and missteps. This document aims to set the record straight regarding what the Air Force and the, state of, and the state of Michigan have actually done and failed to do about the rampant PFAS contamination in Oscoda. And this 13-page report, again, has 86 references, and you can find the report at uh, the Great Lakes PFAS Action, Action Network website, which is glpan.org. Again, that's glpan.org. Okay. All right, thank you, Ms. Westberg. Thank you for your time. Well, good. Well, so we also had a comment that was submitted as a question in the, the, the virtual meeting uh, from Jennifer Hill. Just want to check with co-chair. Shall I read that off? It's about two sentences, two or three sentences. Okay. Absolutely. Great. So um, this is, again, a comment from Jennifer Hill, and it reads as follows, quote, Hi, this is Jennifer Hill with National Wildlife Federation. I'm not able to stay on for the whole meeting, but would like it read into the record that the National Wildlife Federation stands behind the report released last week with NOW. We have shown that the Air Force and State of Michigan can and should be doing more to address PFAS cleanup at this site. And we look forward to working with both entities to get to meaningful cleanup as quickly as possible, end quote. So um, there's a comment from Jennifer Hill. Uh, let me just ask if there are any members of the public in person who would like to make a comment to the RAD. Okay. Yes, please uh, come on over to the microphone stand right here. And if there are others in person who would like to make a, a comment, um, please do line up behind as well. Um, if you could, if you would like to, please state your name first and then go ahead with your three-minute comment. Okay, my name is Chris Poulon. And could you read where, where you stopped with that comment here? Uh, I, the last words were, to get to meaningful cleanup as quickly as possible. Okay. All right. And if you could get real close to that mic, please. Thank you. I'll get as close as I can. How's that? I don't know. I feel like I'm screaming if I'm too close. <laughs> um, I have a comment about some of the discussion here tonight. And the Air Force and the state and the community of Oscoda has been at this for many years now. We've been through many different people. We have lots of personalities. Uh, but I thought that things were coming around so that we were being civil and cordial and cooperative and welcoming. And it seems from one of the comments tonight, who was the attorney, whoever was online, who was talking to, uh, to Kathy when she asked for the Air Force to comment on the report, was uh, dismissive. It was insensitive. And the tone of voice was very... Um, non-partner-like. So I was very, very disappointed to hear that. When when anybody comes to Oscoda who has not lived here, you have to understand who you're talking to. We are people who have been poisoned. We have been poisoned while defending our country. 
in the Air Force, it's not the people maybe who are sitting in front of us today, but the Air Force as a whole is responsible for that. They did not, they have not been transparent. They had, so now it's a new day and we need to pick up and, and move on from that. But when we talk about the Air Force, I know it's hard not to take it personal, but it's not personal. It's the Air Force as an institution, but when you're talking to us, it is very personal because it is our lives and our families and our environment and our properties and our future and our children. So please, please, I beg you, keep that in mind when you come to Oscoda because we will call you out every single time. Thank, you. Can Thank I, you very much. Can I please. reply, please? I'm not trying to be dismissive. I'm trying to be I'm active. Not. It wasn't me. I, her was comment Sharon. was was the Sorry, yes. Dr. Barley, any any response you'd like to share? All I know is that we are forming a team. We have formed a team where we are trying to do our best for you. The time I spend here is the time I spend away from my family, my kids. I want my kids to grow up knowing that we're doing something that's meaningful. Everywhere I've been, I've had meaningful projects, and I want that here too. And I want to be able to come and visit. I want to be able to bring my family here. You know, I want to be able to make things good, make things right. So you have a commitment from me. I will share what I can. I will be transparent. I will, you know, work with the team. And we are all one big team working together. So. Great. Thank you. And Ms. Kulan, thank you for your comment. Are there others in person who would like to make a comment to the RAP? Yes, sir. Mr. Gaines. I would like to make a comment. Uh, you know, I noticed last night that the uh, O&M costs, the operation and maintenance costs for the central treatment plant facility was fled, spread over 30 years. Uh, and then I thought about the fact that the Arrow Street plant has been pumping PFAS polluted water since the mid 1980s, and it's still pumping water that that needs to be treated. Uh, I I just wonder what is the the true effectiveness long term uh, of these plans. I I wonder if the pollution here will be cleaned up when my grandchild is my age. Uh, it's it's a scary thought. But I, I. So, Bill, can I take a stab at answering that? Yeah. So, I don't think pump and treat is going to solve everything. I don't think it's our end all. So, part of what I've done at other bases, at other installations, is we've employed innovative approaches to move progress forward. And that's what we're doing here. We've got sort of projects coming to us and looking at trying. Foam fractionation trenches. We are talking about doing that at VRMO. We've got the MAP project that we're talking about doing down at Three Pipes right now. We've got we've got other ones that have come to us talking about microbial. Um, that was an AFWORKS project coming to us about um, a microbial solution potentially. So there's a lot going on, and as we evaluate and see different ways to move forward. We'll move forward, and I'm sharing a lot of this information with Mark, and he can share it with you. And there's got to be better ways. There's got to be better technologies, and I think we can get there as long as we continue talking and working together, and not being afraid of trying something new. We need to be able to try something new. Amen. Are there other comments to be made to the RAB um, from those in person? Okay, let me ask for those who are uh, connected virtually, if you would just raise your hand electronically if you would like to make a comment to the RAB. And again, just raise your hand electronically if you would like to make a comment. And I see Rex Vaughn has a hand up, so, uh, uh, let's see, Sarah, if you don't mind unmuting Rex. Rex, it sounds like we can probably hear you. Go ahead and, and say something to confirm. Good evening. This is Rex Vaughn. Can you hear me? 
Yes, sir, we can. Go ahead, sir. All right, a, a question for the, the engineering design team. Did they ever evaluate what it would take to expand um, the central treatment plant to allow that pipeline to run farther to the northwest along F41 and pick up some of the additional plumes that have been identified by Eagle? Is there, was there ever any engineering analysis done? Are you talking about an additional three or 400 gallons a minute? Or are you talking about a whole new building? What, what, what caused the Air Force to say, we're gonna live within the confines of the existing structure? Can we have Paula, okay. Paula Bond with Aerostar? Go ahead, Paula. Sorry. Um, yeah, we actually did look at that. And, and again, we were looking at the best way to move forward to address the risk from the uh, PFOS and PFOA concentrations there at Ken Ratliff Memorial Park moving in. So we, do, we are confined by the capacity at the central, the way that it's built. But we also looked at uh, building a completely new treatment system we looked at, at expansions and different things, and we settled on using the infrastructure that we had because we knew that where the highest concentrations were, we could capture that and treat that with the existing system that we had and get to treatment more expeditiously. So we did look at different things, and we settled on this as the best, best path forward at the current time. So everything to the north will be addressed once the RI is complete or if there is something and I think Dr. Varley can elaborate on this. If there is something that we find during the RI that leads us to another interim action or uh, another um, early action, then, then the Air Force will look at that and, and take that on. So, but everything to the north will be addressed. We're not saying it's, it's never gonna be addressed just for this current interim action. This is the best, we thought the best path forward. So we are taking care of what is most critical right now. As we define using the RI data, to determine what we need to take care of next. And we will continue taking action where we can take action. A follow-up question, if I may, please. Absolutely. Um, if you went another 1,500 feet up F41, how many addition, additional gallons per minute would you have had to accommodate in the design? So Jim, the engineer. Yeah, I'm gonna have our design engineer answer that question. And I can tell you that the well spacing uh, based on the groundwater modeling is 250 feet apart. So Jim. Well, based on, again, the modeling that was done, uh, as Paula, indicated we're looking at spacings of about 250 feet. As we go north, uh, our projections are that each well would need to pump about 50 gallons a minute. So your, I think your question was 1,500 additional feet? Or, or, or 2,000, or, or, or at what point did you determine that you blew past any capabilities of the existing structure without a larger facility at central treatment? Um, well, we're pretty much there now. I don't know if you were able to participate in last night's uh, meeting, but one of the things that I discussed was you can't, you know, when you look at a thousand gallons a minute, that is the maximum capacity that the pipes and the pumps and the tanks can handle. Uh, but the analogy would be, you know, again, the red line on your car, maybe 6,000 RPM. Yeah, I, I heard that. I heard that. Well, so it's still valid. I mean, in that, you know, I also heard like when you were reading okay. earlier, a it comment. Bigger, of, it means bigger pipes and bigger pumps and bigger tanks, because you probably want to stay below 10 feet per second and all that kind of hydraulic stuff that I spent 40 years in my career dealing with. So I'm just trying okay. to get a handle on where the economics of a longer run up 41 crossed over a point of diminishing returns where you said, you know, we got to live with what we got. Let okay. me jump in real quick and just pull us all into one conversation, if I could. Uh, let, let me just pull us all into one conversation. Yeah. Jen, go no, ahead. no, those are those are good questions and good observations. And so there's more than one driver here. So, uh, you know, if the goal, uh, if we knew the distribution of contamination, if we looked at the current knowledge of the plume, and we had a very high concentration that extended a, a you know, 2,000 feet, uh, could you go and design something uh, that could accommodate that? 
the, the short answer is, of course, you could. But you would probably, at some point, you know, getting back to the hydraulics, you would end up putting an additional treatment plant further to the north before you continue to go further and further and further. All right, so these systems, the head, the driving force of these comes from submersible pumps that are in the wells. And so, you know, at some point you get up to a horsepower size that's bigger, requires a bigger well, and there's just a domino effect. But the, one of the main elements is as we looked at the available data, and that's the first thing I did when I took on this assignment almost a year ago now, was we went to the Wood Report and we went and looked at other data that was available. And we used the, the model that has been developed at the site. So it was an IRA. The mission was cut off as much flux going into Van Etten Lake as quickly as possible. That was the mission, still is in my mind. Now, if you wanna change the objectives, you can take a, a different approach, okay? But right now, we don't have information to indicates high concentrations that if you went another thousand feet, yes, you would capture some additional stuff. But what, what I've seen on the data that is all inclusive of Eagle's data, the Air Force data, all the data, I mean, those plume maps represent all the data that we have to look at. Uh, and so the, you know, the decision is the RI is going on right now. So at the same time, we're expediting the IRA, we're expediting the, IR, uh, the, the RI, and we're gonna look at those feasibilities, and there are going to be hot spots to the north, and we are gonna have to come up with ways to address those. We just felt like once you got to a certain distance away from the central plant, at that point, it would make sense to address those with another facility. And, I, and, I, I, I and, 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 thank you. And, and let me just ask Jim, if you could uh, state your, your last name as well oh, in your organization. Jim Romer. Yes. Great. All right. But the key thing, yeah. The and, key th Sorry. and over to uh, Dr. Burns. The key thing is we want to cut off where the most risk is to human health and ecological risk. It is important. And the sooner we can get it done, the better off everybody will be, especially with the fact that I'm seeing people out at the beach. We we need to address that issue now, not two years from now to build a bigger system so that we can pump up further gradient. If another technology turns up being better, it makes sense to apply another technology too. We do not want to get stuck with pump and treat because we're investing in the here without thinking about the future either. So think about everything holistically. Right now, biggest, hottest part of the plume heading towards where people hang out. We need to take care of that. Upgrade it, we're refining that area. We'll address that next. If there's something going into that lake, we'll go ahead, we'll program, plan, and we'll work towards it together to address it. And if that means another pump and treat system upgrading, that's fine. But if that means that we can do something with foam fractionation, a bio trench through the CERTA program, if that's successful, that might be a better way because you're taking care of it in a totally, in a way that gets rid of PFOA, PFOS. We're not having to use filter media and we're getting rid of it. And another, I mean, and there's other ways. I mean, even stabilizations or solidification type methods that we could do transects to keep things from going into the lake. There's multiple solutions. Um, and I mean, to be able to work through it, we need the data. And that's what Aerostar is doing for us right now. They're collecting the data so we can make smart data-driven decisions together. Thank you, Dr. Barley. And Mr. Vaughn, thank you for your, your comment. You're welcome. Great. Okay, let me check to see if there are others who have joined virtually who would like to make a comment to the RAD. Please just raise your hand electronically, if you would. And I see Carol Cole has a hand up. So Carol, we'll turn to you. And Carol, go ahead. Okay, Carol is unmuted, so we should be able to hear you. Uh, Carol, we are not hearing you right, right now. Can you try saying something? 
Uh, looks like she may have some connectivity issues. So we will come back to Carol Cole. Um, are there others who would like to make a comment? Okay, and just to check again, others here who are here in person who would like to make a comment to the rep. Okay, let me just check in. Uh, I see uh, Greg Gregory Cole has a hand raised. So Gregory, let's turn to you. And Sarah, let's unmute uh, Gregory Cole, please. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can. Okay, uh, my question is, um, with the winter season coming up here, what will Eagle and the Air Force be doing to, um, of course, stay busy? Uh, I know that you're out collecting data. When will that stop, and what will be you you be doing during the winter season to get this going in 2022? in the spring so we will be working feedback <laughs> yeah hey greg can you mute my phone okay uh all right so we will work as much as we can as far as we can until the weather makes it so that we cannot work any longer so our goal is to accomplish as much of the field work as we can so we have data to look at over the winter so that we can then provide any step outs come next field season for the RI. The goal is to get as much as we can as far as the IRA is done this field season. Whatever we don't get done, hopefully we'll have buildings up and we can work inside the buildings all winter. Um, I also know that Greg has cabins and who knows we might be able to use some of those as we move forward but there's lots of things going on and lots of moving parts and we all need to work together to make sure we're making progress paula do you have anything to add no you hit the nail on the head we are going to do field work for the ri as long as we possibly can as long as the weather holds out and we can actually see the ground <laughs> so that we, we don't uh, uh, misstep. So we're gonna do as much as we can. And with the IRAs, um, like you mentioned, we are hoping that Clark's Marsh is, is the building is put up so that we can work inside um, during the winter and get that thing up and running so that it's ready to go in the spring. So that is our, our, our greatest hope, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna do everything we can and work as long as we can. Great. Gregory, thank you for your question. Um, are you there with with Carol as well? Do, do you know if she has an additional comment that she would like to make? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. We Hello? Can okay, so go ahead and Carol uh, say. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so Carol, go ahead and unmute yourself. I, I heard that you were trying to make a comment. And try that one more time, Carol. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, my name is Carol Cole, and my uh, father owned some property on the lake. I've been following this situation, and I have just sort of a simple question. And I don't know if anybody could really answer it, but I'm trying to get a feeling for if I want to keep the property or let it go. What are the prospects for getting the lake cleaned out from PFAS so it would be safe to fish in the lake within the next 10 years? Great. Thank you for that, that question. Is there any response anyone would like to provide to that? I think data is needed to be able to fully answer that question. Um, because you're saying, what would it take, right? So first of all, we need to know where to cut off the plumes. We need to know how our fade and transport is. We need to get full remedies set up. My goal is to move forward as fast as we possibly can and to get things done. Um, and the only way to do that is everybody working together. 
Um, Paula, do you have any thoughts on this or anybody else on the team? My thought would be that it's really, that's a great question and it's a hard one to answer. And I, I don't think we're at a position where we have enough data to even make a uh, uh, any kind of prediction <laughs> on that. I would be, yeah. I would, would not make any, any prediction at this point. We're just not there yet. We don't have enough data. Okay, thank you. That answers my question. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much, Carol. And uh, Gregory, I see that your hand is raised. Do you have an additional uh, comment you would like to make to the rest? And I see Gregory's hand is raised. You are muted, um, Gregory. So if you would like to come off mute. Okay, it is possible that. Uh, go, ahead. go ahead, Greg. No comment right now. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks for your persistence. Okay, are there any other comments to be made to the RAV from those who have joined us virtually? Please uh, raise your hand electronically if you would like to make a comment. Okay, I don't see any others. Any comments uh, from those in person? Okay. Well, so uh, let's move to slide 27. Uh, we have reached the end of the agenda tonight. Um, before turning to our co-chairs for closing remarks, I'd just like to, to thank all of y'all on, on behalf of myself, Tim Sultan Post, my, my business partners and colleagues at Galen Driscoll, uh, we just appreciate being involved in the process and really applaud the commitment that all of you have, the dedication, Kathy, those hours, those thousands of hours that are put in um, on such an important topic. And so just thank you for, for all the work that, that you're doing. Um, let me turn first to Mr. Mark Henry and then to Dr. Catherine Barley for any closing remarks, sir. I would just like to thank everybody in attendance tonight, virtually and in person. Uh, thanks for all the questions. Um, the RAB has uh, several comments to make to the uh, proposed plan. I look forward to hearing the responses back from the Air Force. Um, I guess that's about it. Thank you. All right, I'd like to thank everybody for attending tonight, both virtually and here in person. I really like seeing everybody face to face. It's really quite nice. So thank you all for coming out and thank you all for your questions. And if you have questions, community rab chair, Mark Henry, you can get them to him and we'll talk them through and I'm sure we can get you an answer. Great. Thank you all. All right, thank you all very much. We are adjourned. Have a good evening.